next to you. Unquestionably, the idea that the universe popped into being uncaused and out of nothing doesn't seem to make much sense and perhaps is the most bizarre, unimaginable and unpalatable idea of all. But have you ever asked yourself how empty four-dimensional space-time could be curved? Have you ever asked yourself how time could slow down? Have you ever asked yourself how the particles separated across the universe can instantaneously interact with each other, so-called non-locality in physics? Or how could they be particles and waves at the same time? Do you believe any of these weird things? Of course not, but who cares what you think? These are not from X-Files or Star Trek, but the most overwhelmingly established and empirically confirmed facts about the world. From physics, of course, and verified uh, in, in, in recent times. Even the um, non-locality which Einstein rejected, so-called spooky action at a distance, as he called it, excuse me. Uh, he refused to accept it, though it has been experimentally verified. Quantum physics is so weird that Richard Feynman joked that he says nobody understands quantum physics, even though it's our most successful scientific theory. What he meant was that you simply can't imagine how the world could possibly be the way it is. But it is. And his advice is that you should stop trying to imagine how it could be so and just do the mathematics. So I have to concede that Dr. Craig's position has great appeal precisely because we all share his intuitions. Like Dr. Craig, or the scientists themselves for that matter, I can't imagine what on earth it actually means to say there was a beginning and there was no space or time before because space and time themselves come into being at the initial cosmological singularity. As Dr. Craig has noted, such a conclusion is profoundly disturbing for anyone who ponders it. But as Dr. Craig points out, that's what our cosmology tells us with overwhelming evidence. So in fact, I agree with his second pre premise, the universe began to exist. We don't dispute that. Surprisingly, as we've heard, Dr. Craig tried to use cosmological science slightly against at least some atheist positions, saying, Typically, atheists have said the universe is just eternal, but if you're an atheist, you just follow science, and you don't have to uh, have a view that's contrary to science in that regard. But a central difference between us is what conclusion we draw from the science. Dr. Craig relies on science, but only to a certain point, and then he balks at what science says. In fact, of course, as Dr. Craig has discussed most knowledgeably in his writings, there is some theoretical disputation about exactly what to say about the earliest moments of the universe concerning time and so on, and whether or not one can perhaps avoid a strict beginning. But I'm happy to agree with his interpretation of the physics for our purposes, so we don't need to discuss, fortunately, things like the hawking penrose singularity theorem and various other esoteric things in physics. So where exactly do we disagree? Well, if you don't go beyond what our science actually tells us, you get what Dr. Craig has described, poetically, as a kind of Gettysburg address of atheism by his long-time debating partner, Quentin Smith. Smith says, I quote, the fact of the matter is that the most reasonable belief is that we came from nothing, by nothing, and for nothing. And he goes on to say, if this cosmology is true, our universe exists without cause and without explanation. It exists non-necessarily, improbably, and causelessly. It exists for absolutely no reason at all. Now, how, of course, Dr. Craig wants to make a further claim and wants to go beyond this to talk about how the universe came to exist. Dr. Craig's other premise is, whatever begins to exist has a cause of its existence. Dr. Craig needs this premise because he wants to prove that God is the cause. Uh, the cause of the universe is God. The question is, where did he get this premise from? Now, this is where, on his own account, he goes beyond, if not against science. Dr. Craig's approach is to simply, and I think gratuitously, elevate common sense intuition as the ultimate court of appeal. However, it has a bad record in the history of science, and in any case, has no independent justification. I share Dr. Craig's intuitions and his gut feelings, but gut feelings don't count for much in science and systematic inquiry, and in my case they're usually indigestion. Dr. Craig is admirably explicit about his views here. I'll quote from what he says. He says, in relation to this question of where the second premise comes from, he says, I'm not going to give a lengthy defense of the point that the beginning of the universe must have been caused. He says, I do not think I need to, for probably no one in his right mind sincerely believes that the universe could pop into existence uncaused out of nothing, end of quote. Well, yes, but Dr. Craig has been challenged on using a notion of cause to explain the origin of the universe, which cannot be the scientific one, because the scientific one can't be applied outside of space and time. Remember, as Dr. Craig agrees, there was no before the Big Bang, and so no cause in the scientifically meaningful sense. Dr. Craig actually concedes the point and says, and I quote, if God's causing the universe cannot be analyzed in terms of current philosophical definitions of causality, then so much the worse for those theories. 
These are the theories which give scientific legitimacy to the notion of cause. Well, what is the basis of Dr. Craig's alternative? Well, just one um, step back. Um, when he says this, uh, he gives the game away because he's admitting that there's no scientific justification for his concept of cause, and he says that's just bad luck. But of course, on this logic, we're naive, intuitively plausible, common sense notions of the solar system, mass, heat, motion, life, and lots of other things in science conflicted with our best scientific theories. Dr. Craig would have said so much the worse for Copernicus, Newton, Darwin, and especially Einstein. So what's the basis of Dr. Craig's alternative to what science says? Again, he's been very explicit acknowledging the problem of creation is not properly a part of physical cosmology, but it is metaphysical problem. That's a quote. Dr. Craig says it is metaphysically impossible that the universe came into being spontaneously out of nothing, and he speaks of our metaphysical intuition and what seems metaphysically absurd. Of course, that's what the Aristotelians said to Galileo too. Metaphysics is just a bogey to scare people. You shouldn't be bullied or bluffed by such philosophical words. The question is, what are the rules for deciding metaphysical truth? Well, there aren't any. It really amounts to nothing more than a fancy way of saying, I don't like it. Well, I don't either, but you're stuck with it. Well, let me go on to the second argument, the um, argument from design, the teleological argument. The immense improbability of some event is often a good argument for an underlying cause or intelligent purpose and design. But not always. It depends on the context and the background theory for that context. If I see, written in the clouds, I love Kylie, it probably wasn't just the wind accidentally blowing the clouds into this shape. Here we have a background, background theory according to which we have more plausible explanations for such an improbable event. Human interest and purposes which, it, which shows why it's not so improbable after all. But we can't just transfer this kind of reasoning by analogy, as the philosopher David Hume argued in his dialogues concerning natural religion. We have no background theory for how universes can come into being, the way we have for how writing comes into being. What alternative theory has scientific support which would make chance a worse explanation in this case? How can you compare the entire universe to the way a watch or a house gets made? That's David Hume's question. I mean, it's not just that the universe is bigger. It's that you can't make analogies from the way things work within the world to the way the whole world works or comes into being. Much less can you take what Hume called this little agitation in our brain, our volition or our will, and ascribe it to the entire universe. What's special about the brain, says Hume? Why not pick a different organ, maybe like your kidney? The point is that you can't actually infer anything from the mere unlikelihood of an event. As Hume asked, how would things look if they were, in fact, an accident? A huge coincidence. <clears throat> if they were, well, uh, they would look as though they weren't. That's the nature of coincidences. So unless you know something about the background, something else about the background, the mere fact of the improbability on its own, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the mere fact, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> that's okay. Thank you. <clears throat> the mere fact of the improbability on its own doesn't tell you anything uh, that uh, is contrary to the possibilities of chance. There's a very compelling fallacy which I'd like to try to explain quickly in this kind of reasoning about improbabilities. Astronomically extravagantly improbable things happen all the time by chance and we don't seek, we don't seek alternative explanations. Consider a hand of 13 cards dealt in the game of bridge. It's not as many as the number of constants for making the world, which Dr. Craig pointed to. But the argument is exactly the same. If you got dealt a hand of all 13 cards, which turned out to be in the same suit, say all spades, what would you think? Well, perhaps someone stacked the deck because the odds against such an amazing fluke are actually one chance in 635,000 million. You'd stop the game and you'd write to column eight and tell them what an amazing coincidence you had. But let's say you're dealt the usual, ordinary, boring hand of mixed up cards. You don't accuse the dealer of cheating and call the Sydney Morning Herald every time you're dealt a hand. But actually, each hand you are dealt is just as improbable, 635,000 million to one. They're all equally improbable and you have to get dealt one of them. It's just that we don't find most of them very interesting. So what? No matter how many cards or physical constants, the outcome has to be one of these. They're equally unlikely as this one that we happen to be in. So the mere unlikelihood of this arrangement is not on its own enough to conclude, on its own, it's not 